challenging for us to have to keep making uh, changes when it comes to meeting. And uh, uh, but I just want to thank everyone for being flexible. Uh, it was a tough call to make to uh, not be able to meet today and uh, in person, uh, especially after having been able to come together for the last two weeks. Uh, but we did want to take the precaution of uh, just with the air quality being as bad as it is. Uh, you know, it just seems like each week there's something that is happening that makes it difficult for us to meet. Uh, last week it was the extreme heat. Uh, this week it's the smoke from the fires. Uh, you know, that's something we should be in prayer for. Um, I have a friend in Oregon who, who lost their home uh, due to the fires. And, uh, you know, the, it's just terrible what we're seeing happen. So uh, just want to let you know that uh, each week we will let you know, uh, hopefully at least by Friday evening, what our plans will be uh, for service. Uh, these fires are not going away anytime soon. So I think we'll have to kind of monitor things. Uh, and as much as we you know, would love to keep meeting uh, on campus, um, and that's something let's keep praying toward. Uh, you know, it'd be nice if we could even meet indoors uh, at some point. Uh, but let's trust the Lord for those things. In well, the last couple of weeks, uh, I've had a chance to first talk about the mission, vision, and passion statements of Lighthouse Bible Church. And, uh, you know, I hope that was a good reminder for those of you who've been here for a while and for those of you who are newer to our church. Uh, I hope that was a good uh, kind of introduction to what our church stands for and really uh, and just recognizing the authority of Christ in calling us to be his church and to do the things that he has called us to do, especially to to make disciples of Christ, to, to plant churches, and to love God and people. Last week we talked about we talked about Christ being the head of the church and being the head of this church, Lighthouse Bible Church. And today I want to talk about something that really kind of practically uh, extends from that. Uh, I, I want to pose a question to you. Uh, to all of you as uh, part of the Lighthouse LA family, if you truly believe that Jesus Christ is the head of this church and that you uh, personally have submitted your life uh, to the Lordship of Christ, uh, will you be committed to obeying the command to encourage one another in love on a daily basis to the glory of God? Now, let me ask that again. Are you committed? to obeying the command to encourage one another in love on a daily basis to the glory of God. Today I'll be looking at the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, but just to give you uh, a little bit of uh, background, the book of Hebrews uh, was written to Jewish believers who were facing persecution, uh, as well as wrestling with the backdrop of their Judaistic heritage. Uh, there are temptations to go back to the rituals and traditions of the Mosaic Law. Uh, and so there was the possibility of defection, uh, which we see mentioned several times in the book of Hebrews. Uh, there was also the reality of persecution. The church was being persecuted during that time. And so there was fear. And, and also because of that reason, it posed the possibility of abandoning their identification with Christ in his church. So when we read the book of Hebrews, knowing that there's that backdrop, we understand better why there are these references to the Old Testament, the Levitical priesthood, uh, sacrifices according to the law, and even there's the mention of angel worship, uh, which, had, which was a distinctive theme of certain Jews uh, from the Qumran uh, community. That's where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so the author of Hebrews, he is familiar with these issues and is addressing the believers in light of them. You know, if there's one theme in the book of Hebrews that really stands out, it's the superiority of Christ. Christ is the superior one as the ultimate high priest, as the one who sacrificed uh, his life for sins. Uh, this is such a prominent truth. So from the get-go, uh, the author of Hebrews uh, makes it very clear. Jesus is greater uh, than the angels, uh, Hebrews 1.4. Uh, Jesus is at the right hand of the throne of the Father, verse 13 of chapter 1. Uh, that all creation is subject to Christ, chapter 2, verse 7. Jesus is the one who humbled himself by going to the cross so that he could become our merciful and faithful high priest in all things. 
he made propitiation for our sin, Hebrews 2.17, and is counted worthy of more glory than Moses. So if you can see this uh, background being addressed uh, and, and you consider the Messianic Jewish uh, Messianic community that was wrestling uh, with these challenges, uh, one thing that actually really stands out in the book of Hebrews is this issue of uh, unbelief. Uh, if you look at Hebrews chapter 3, uh, starting from verse 12, it says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You know, when you read through the Old Testament, one of the things that you see, especially during the time of Moses, as he is leading the Israelites, uh, so many of them were hardened in unbelief. And because of their unbelief, because they did not truly believe in God, and that's an amazing thing to consider in that uh, they saw God at work. They saw miracles. They saw God do uh, incredible things, especially in being delivered from Egypt and all throughout their time in the wilderness. But because of their unbelief, uh, they were not allowed to enter into the promised land. They had to wander for 40 years. And here, uh, the readers of the book of Hebrews, they're cautioned to check whether their lives are characterized by this kind of unbelief. Because unbelief would ultimately, ultimately be revealed through disobedience and evil. You know, that's why it says there in uh, verse 12 of Hebrews 3, uh, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. You know, you could look like you are following God, and, and that's what the Israelites looked like when they came out of Egypt. All of them were following uh, the path that God had laid out for them. But it didn't mean that all of them believed in, and they ultimately revealed themselves through their disobedience. Now, what's really interesting there in Hebrews 3.13 is that in that context, it says, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Isn't it interesting that in battling unbelief, there is a call to encourage one another? We're going to talk more about that later. Now, when we go again, look at the book of Hebrews, and Jesus is described as the perfect high priest who sympathizes with us because he has been tempted as we have, but he didn't sin. This is what's so wonderful about this. Jesus understands what we go through. And because of that, we can confidently approach the throne of grace. Uh, when we pray, we can anticipate receiving grace and mercy to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16 when you jump over to Hebrews chapter 6, which is a very challenging chapter to interpret, it talks about how some will fall away, even though they have been enlightened to hear the word of God, that they've experienced the work of the Holy Spirit in such ways that they cannot deny. But to be enlightened and to experience those things doesn't necessarily <clears throat> mean that you're saved. It would be the equivalent of uh, how many today uh, have grown up in the church. They've been blessed with the ministry of God's word. So you've heard God's word preached to you. You've experienced uh, the sweet fellowship that comes with the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, when we gather together and when we enjoy uh, the fellowship that is only possible because of the Holy Spirit working within us, uh, even those who are not believers can be blessed by that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you've come to saving faith, though it might appear like it to someone. Now, one of the challenges <clears throat> that any church will have to face is whether those who profess that they know Christ, are they actually genuinely saved? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, we ultimately can't read someone's heart, and we don't know uh, where someone really stands. But one thing we can do is we can uh, get some indicators. First, uh, what do people say they believe? And then how do they carry out their theological beliefs? Uh, past week, Ligonier Ministries released their 2020 State of Theology, which they do every two years. Uh, and they do a survey of the evangelical church. And uh, 
you know, in many ways, it's very stunning to see the results of this survey. And, and this is the survey that I forwarded to you uh, to have you fill out because I wanted to see where our church stood too. But generally speaking, this uh, 2020 State of Theology uh, survey revealed a few things. Uh, and I want to share some of those things with you. First, 52% of evangelicals agree that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. You know, just, just think of that. Half of evangelicals, and, and we're talking about those who claim to be more on the, I guess you could say the conservative side of the church that would adhere to orthodox theology. Half do not believe that Jesus was God. Now, th that is one of the most foundational uh, uh, truths of our faith that Jesus is God. If you remember uh, Fundamentals of Faith and talking about the person of Christ, uh, we talk about, about both the deity of Christ as well as the humanity of Christ. But 52% of evangelicals agree that Jesus was just a great teacher, not God. Uh, also, 48% of evangelicals agree that the Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. So again, essentially half of evangelicals don't believe that God's word is literally true, that it contains myths. Um, now, you know, based on the results from the Lighthouse LA survey, uh, I'm thankful that uh, we, we see that, uh, uh, at least those who have responded, 100% of those of you who responded uh, did not agree that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was, but he was not God. And so that's the correct answer. He, he was God. And so you should have disagreed with that statement. Uh, and a hundred percent of our church also believe, agree or disagree that the Bible is not literally true. Uh, though 6% of that disagreement was partial disagreement, which is, you know, interesting for me to consider. Uh, going back to the survey, 54% of evangelicals agree that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It is not about objective truth. And, and that, again, is also a very stunning consideration that half of evangelicals don't believe that there is uh, objective truth found in Scripture. 42% uh, of evangelicals agree that God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Uh, that's, that's just amazing that uh, those who have been taught that the gospel uh, message is that it is only through Jesus Christ alone that we can come to the Father, John 14, 6, uh, that, again, close to half uh, say that it, there, there are other ways to God. 22% uh, of evangelicals agree that gender identity is a matter of choice. Now that, that is also something that could, should be very, very concerning uh, because that, that, that's, uh, I mean, it's nowhere close to what the secular world would think. But uh, still, to, to think that evangelicals would uh, believe that. Now, at our church, we, we have, according to the survey, 95% uh, disagreed that gender identity is a matter of cho a choice, and 5% uh, partly disagreed. And... You know, just, just uh, you know, not, not to put too much into the surveys, <clears throat> but I think it's interesting, and, and I'm not sure if you had a chance to take the survey, please still do so. Uh, but I hope the point of it will be to help you think through. So do I actually believe these things that we say we stand for? Um, interestingly enough, uh, those who took the survey, you know, from our church, 88% disagreed that churches must provide entertaining worship services if they want to be effective. Uh, that means 12% uh, don't fully, uh, you know, they maybe think that there is place for entertaining worship service. And, and part of that is learning to talk through that because, you know, what, what do we mean by entertaining? Uh, you know, does it mean that things have to be boring? Uh, no. Um, Maybe the most concerning thing that I would want to address at our church is that 97% uh, agree that Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of my sin. And uh, there were 3% who partly agreed. 
And, uh, you know, one question I would have is, uh, why, why would you partly agree or not, uh, as opposed to fully agree? Now, that, that, that's just one consideration when you think about, uh, do you really believe what you say you believe? Uh, and I've learned over the years that there are those who have uh, maybe paid lip service to theological positions, uh, but maybe there are those who struggle. Uh, it could be that there are those who are still not fully confident, and, and that's okay because you're still uh, you still need to learn and grow, and, and that's why we're here to help you with that. Uh, it could be also though that maybe there are some who are struggling with doubts and, and maybe who who don't really have confidence in in these theological truths. So that kind of provides some of the backdrop for Hebrews ten twenty four twenty five. Uh, and I want to read that to you now. Uh, it says in Hebrews 10, 24, 25, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. So when you, when you think about how serious uh, the book of Hebrews is uh, kind of painting the picture that, that there are those who are really um, facing hardship, persecution, uh, but they're also struggling with their, their, their background, uh, their Judaistic background. And so many are tempted to abandon what they have professed to follow. That is, they say they are Christ's followers, but there are many who are struggling with that. Uh, and there are some who have already abandoned. Now, this uh, passage in Hebrews 10.24, uh, just uh, to provide you a little bit more perspective, Remember that this is written to Christians collectively when it says, let us consider, you know, so this is not simply just a, an individual matter. There, there's a corporate nature to this. Uh, there's also the charge to, to do this to one another. Let us consider how to stimulate one another. And uh, all of us as Christians are called to do this to one another. So don't ever forget that there is this corporateness to this obedience that we are called to, and, and that, that really implies accountability, uh, that we are called to do this to one another. But this, this whole concept of encouraging one another, uh, I, I think this is something so significant that maybe we don't really consider. It's not something that happens naturally, this encouraging of one another. It is actually a supernatural act because it takes being united in Christ. It takes being humble. And it takes a very serious consideration of others being more important than myself. That I would not just consider my own personal interests, but that I would actually think of the interests of others before mine. I mean, this really should remind you of Philippians chapter 2. Uh, starting from verse 1, it says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And then it points us to the person of Christ. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, when, when our lives are fixed on the person of Christ, and, and that's why last week I really wanted to make it clear, like the headship of Christ in the church is so important. When you are committed to what Christ has taught us, you know, when you look at Matthew chapter 28, um, and, and in verse 28, when it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded, if we really take those things to heart, we should be committed to encouraging one another in the love of Christ. So two main points I want to share with you today. First is what you should do. The second is what you should not do. But we're going to first talk about what you should do. And that is to encourage in love. I want to really focus on this principle of encouraging in love because it is vital. It is an indispensable activity in the life of the church. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, starting from verse 24. It says, uh, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. This word consider, 
Uh, let's look at that for a bit. It means uh, to observe or to notice, to contemplate in respect to or in regard to something. So when we see here in Hebrews 10.24, 10, there's a very deliberate, purposeful act taking place here. It's that you would really notice, that you would think through carefully in respect to doing something. And here the author of Hebrews says, have you considered stimulating one another to love and good deeds? Now, the love that we're talking about here is the love of God. It's the word agape in the Greek, and it's not just any kind of love. It is God's kind of love, a sacrificial, unselfish love that carries the fullness, uh, especially of 1 Corinthians 13, when you see where it says uh, love is patient and love is kind. You know, this is a love that we are to uh, share with one another. Then when it talks about the good deeds uh, that we are called to stimulate to one another to love and good deeds, these good deeds really are to flow out of that love toward one another. Now, in the Bible Dictionary, it's interesting. It gives the antonym to this Greek word consider, and uh, it's the word to disobey. And I think that's a very interesting thought to, 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 to really work through. When you uh, have not considered as we are called to, you are then disobeying. In other words, you can't afford to be passive about this. You know, you just can't say, well, I'm too busy. I, I don't have time to think through these things. I don't have time to consider. If you are not considering, you are disobeying. The command here is to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So the question is, have you seriously considered how to do that? In fact, have you considered the serious nature of what it means that the head of the church, Jesus Christ, has commanded us with a very specific command? We are called to consider how to stimulate one another to loving good deeds, to encourage one another, even daily. This idea of considering, it's not just to think of a nice idea or a suggestion to think that this is some sort of optional activity. If you do not consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, you are in serious disobedience to the head of the church. So this act of consideration is very deliberate. It's not something you just gloss over or treat in a cavalier manner. You are to give careful, thorough thought. You are to give your fullest attention in how you would stimulate one another to loving good deeds. Now, what would that practically look like? Well, this morning, uh, obviously going back to this online you know, form of uh, having church service uh, makes it a little bit more challenging, but it does not prevent you still from encouraging someone. The question is, how deliberately uh, are you thinking through that? Did you take some time this morning to consider, to contemplate that there would be um, this act of obedience that reflects something that should be distinctive of us as a Christian uh, people, a, a, as a body of Christ? That the natural characteristic of the life of Lighthouse LA should be such that when you gather to participate uh, in fellowship and worship, you are thinking about how to stimulate someone in love and good deeds. Now, what does it mean to stimulate? Well, the word stimulate means to stir up or to provoke. Uh, it could also mean to sharpen, uh, to encourage to some action or feeling. Uh, there's a negative way of using this thought, uh, a bad way, if you stir someone up toward anger or to stir up contention. You know, in Hebrews, uh, I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it, it tells, uh, you know, parents uh, or fathers not to provoke their children to, to anger. You know, and that's something as we as parents have to be very careful about, that we, we don't use words or we don't, you know, uh, conduct ourselves in ways that would stir our children to anger. I mean, that's a command there. But positively speaking, it means that as we have opportunity to come together, when we assemble together, have you considered how you are going to stimulate your brother or sister in a God-honoring way? Now, you really only have two choices here. You can either stir someone up to 
to love God more, to love people, to, to honor God through their lives, or you can stir them up to sin. You know, in fact, I, I think at every church, there are certain people who have the, the gift of provoking uh, in a bad way. You know, when they, when it's almost as if when they come to church, they have taken time, they have considered how to, to, to stir people up in ways that will hurt them. You know, they've actually planned it. They've maybe even plotted what they would do. And they carry out devious things to sow discord and disharmony in the body. You know, I mean, this is a really sad reality in many churches that there are those who come and they come with a very clear intention to be divisive, to, to, to be disruptive, to, to tear down instead of to build up. Now, if we are obedient to Christ, we need to say, say to ourselves, am I thinking carefully? Am I considering carefully how I'm going to stimulate someone else to love and good deeds? You know, to even be more specific, to love one another, to show the love of Christ, maybe through hospitality, through generosity, uh, to really show the love that Christ has loved us with by loving one another. Do you consider how you can sharpen others to think about loving others and serving others through good deeds? I mean, that's really the idea here is when we gather together, are we stimulating one another to loving good deeds? Are we helping each other move toward that end? Now, I can tell you one of the great joys of being a pastor is when I see members doing this. You know, in fact, you know, there are members who will come up to me and say, Pastor John, I have this idea uh, of what I'd like to see happen at church and, and what I see really behind that, that request uh, in wanting to do something is that they want to stimulate others to love and good deeds. I remember back in San Diego, we had a situation where one of the ladies of the church uh, who was a member was abandoned by her husband and, and she was left to care for you know, a small child and a baby on the way. And what was really amazing to watch was to see people come together and say, you know what, can we do something about this? Uh, and there were those who, who were very generous in collecting money to get, uh, to, get, to get gift cards for food, for gas, to pay utilities and so forth. Uh, I remember another time in San Diego, there was a single mother with a child uh, struggling to find a job because she had no transportation. Uh, so, that, so there are members of the church that came together and said, you know what, let's, let's raise money to buy her a car. Uh, and they were able to buy a used car. And then there are some guys who were really, uh, who enjoyed working, doing auto maintenance. And so they, they all put, pulled together and they fixed up this car. And, uh, but I think one of the most amazing things that happened in that was I heard that a, a collegian gave $1,000 to that, that cause. And, and I'm thinking, you know, for those of your collegians here, you might think, uh, you know, that collegian must have been loaded. No, this was just a regular, normal, everyday collegian uh, who uh, was probably more frugal than others, I guess. Uh, but to give in that way, you know, that, that, that's one of the things that really is amazing when the love of Christ drives someone to serve and to give and to consider the needs of others around them. I mean, I, I could tell you countless other stories along the way uh, where I've seen such generosity and such kind heartedness and consideration because the love of Christ was driving it. And, you know, on that note, I want to really thank, uh, thank everyone. Uh, many of you heard that uh, Romeo uh, broke his leg uh, last weekend. Uh, he had kind of an awkward fall. His, his leg got caught in a blanket, and he fell on the hard floor, floor and uh, broke both legs in his uh, broke broke both bones in his left leg. Uh, and uh, you know, it was a, a very shocking event. Uh, and uh, you know, had to take him to the hospital and found out it was going to cost a lot of money. And uh, you know, when my gals first asked, you know, you know, would it be okay to have some sort of GoFundMe uh, effort made? Uh, you know, inside I was a little hesitant because I was thinking, you know, who, who's going to want to give to help a dog? I mean, I can understand maybe wanting to help a person, uh, but would people want to do that? But, um, you know, I, I was just really um, amazed, you know, that there have been some very wonderful people and there are a good number of you, even at our church, who contributed to that. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, but, you know, I wanted to let you know, like, um, this actually was a, a big 
challenge and hardship. In fact, uh, you know, many of you know that I have not always had the easiest relationship with Romeo, uh, but in the last number of months, we've become much closer and uh, been getting along really well. And uh, when he got hurt, uh, I have to admit, I cried. Uh, I was really sad, and um, uh, but I was really touched by uh, those of you who helped contribute, even to care for our family in that way. So thank you so much. But I want to challenge all of you to consider this. Does this kind of active consideration toward stimulating, toward loving good deeds, does this characterize our church on a consistent basis? Now, I know for some of you, you might say, well, yeah, I don't know, because I don't, I don't get this loving good deeds to me. Well, you know, if that's your initial thought, you're, you're miss, you're, I think you're maybe missing the point here. You, you are to consider stimulating others to love and good deeds. You see, the issue is, am I being obedient to the command to stimulate? It's not, am I going to be a recipient of these things? You see, I mean, that, that's avoiding the issue of obedience. Now, if everybody was stimulating one another to love and good deeds, I mean, then in that sense, all of us would hopefully be able to experience the blessings that come when everybody is doing that. But this is a very clear, uh, I think, uh, issue that we have to consider. And to be very specific then, when we talk about stimulating to loving good deeds, one very particular way to do that is to encourage one another. Now, what does it mean to encourage? Uh, the word encourage here in Hebrews 10 is this idea of coming alongside. Uh, it's the idea of, you know, standing next to someone to aid them, to help them, to comfort them, to encourage them, to exhort, uh, to call them to do something, to even beseech them uh, strongly, to exhort, to admonish. You know, there, there's this, it's really this multifaceted kind of picture where you would come alongside someone and you would call them to pursue a way that would help them to become more like Christ. And whether it's through words of comfort or words of admonishment, words of exhortation, uh, it is a calling to action as you stand alongside your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, that you would say, because I love you, because I want to uh, challenge you to love Christ more and to live in a way that really honors him, these are the things I'm going to share with you. Yesterday, Dr. Somerville uh, met with uh, some of the men, and we met at 7 in the morning, and that, that was uh, not an easy thing to do. Uh, but he was talking about this idea of encouraging uh, in his notes, and uh, you know, he says, what do you do when you encourage someone? What does this look like? Uh, the Greek word parakaleo, uh, he said, it, it's this idea of urging one to pursue some course of action with regard to the future as somewhat contrasted with comfort, which is comforting someone about a past situation. Now, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that encouraging one another, you, you can't comfort someone. But really, the, the, the maybe thrust here of encouraging is this idea of seeking after someone to beseech them, to pray for them, to plead with them, to follow Christ, to pursue Christ, to live to his glory. And so in whatever you're going to say to them, that is really at the heart of it. You know, when we, when we maybe think of the word of uh, word encouraging, some might think it's just kind of some use of fluttery words, you know, butter someone up. That is not the case here. It is a very purposeful, considerate, deliberate, thoughtful, and appropriate communication of thoughts that would call someone to act in such a way that they would be in line with honoring and glorifying Christ in word and thought and deed. You know, so that's why it, it kind of covers a spectrum. You know, sometimes someone's sad, and so you need to lift them up. Uh, sometimes someone is, they're not thinking right. You know, they're maybe angry, they're upset. And so you have to kind of call them out and say, you know what? You cannot exercise unrighteous anger. Like in James chapter 1, when it says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, because the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So when you see your brother or sister uh, in Christ, and they're angry about something, to encourage them means that you need to tell them, you know what, don't let anger cloud your thinking, blind you to the truth. 
You need to set aside that anger. You need to walk in such a way that will honor the Lord. Now, you know, when we, we, when we encourage someone, what we're really doing is we're saying, you know, I am loving you with the love of Christ. And I want to stimulate you in such a way that would cause you to love and for you to do the good deeds which you have been called to live out to the glory of God. And we do that particularly in the context of our church. I mean, when you think about it, it is not an accident that you are here at Lighthouse Bible Church LA. And God has brought all the people that belong to this church family. God has brought them into your life so that you would have the opportunity to encourage them. Now, you know, someone might come to you discouraged. Maybe because they feel isolated. Maybe, maybe because they feel defeated or discriminated against. Maybe someone has shown partiality toward them. Maybe someone has felt let down by others. There's so many situations. Uh, and I'm aware of these things, you know, uh, as a pastor, because, you know, people will share their struggles. But I'm not the only one called to encourage. You see, all of us are called to encourage. And what we do by encouraging someone is to say, you know what? Fix your eyes on Christ. In other words, we're not, we're not here to just apply some bandages <coughs> and to give some just e emotional comfort, though, though that's part of it. We ultimately want to point people to Christ. And so, you know, Christ is going to be your ultimate comfort. Christ is going to be your ultimate strength. We are to remind each other of all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places that we have received in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1. We are to consider, even in the midst of trials, to rejoice and to celebrate God's work uh, in what he's doing even through those trials, James chapter 1. Do you realize that every time we gather together, and even when we are not physically gathered, we have in mind our church family, the body of Christ, as it relates to us, we have a myriad of opportunities fulfilled to fulfill this command, to encourage one another. And, and it's not just something that we are called to do every once in a while. It's something that we are called to do every time we gather together. Now, even with the limitations right now due to our circumstances with you know, the, the virus and, and even now the fires and smoke and so forth. We have been given so many different kinds of means, you know, through media, through, you know, various instruments, which we can communicate words of comfort, words of exhortation, words of blessing, reminders of God's goodness and grace. Now, again, remember, this is not an optional activity. We are called to do this work of encouragement. It's actually a ministry toward one another that all of us are called to do. And this is something that not only are you called to do, you are to help contribute to cultivating uh, the kind of corporate obedience that our church family is to be known by. In other words, can you say that you are contributing to Lighthouse LA Church being a place where it is defined by encouraging of one another. Now, how often are we called to encourage one another? Go back to Hebrews 3.13. I mentioned this earlier. It says, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, I mentioned earlier, it's interesting that in the context of uh, facing the struggle of unbelief, here is this call to encourage one another daily. And it's interesting. It says, as long as it is called today. So uh, what's today? Today. This day is today. So when are you going to encourage? Any day that's called today. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but today. Now, something that should sober you is this. If you don't encourage daily, you could well be on the path to becoming hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Because that's what Hebrews 3.13 says. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now think of it this way. 
you might be struggling. You might be having a hard time. In fact, you might be saying, you know, how come no one's encouraging me? Well, instead of waiting to be encouraged, are you considering how you can encourage someone else today? Not later, not, not, not tomorrow, not down the road, but are you going to consider someone today, uh, consider encouraging someone today? You know, instead of complaining today, and a lot of people do complain, including myself, instead of complaining how others are not doing the things that they should be doing, that they're not being helpful, that they're not encouraging, will you choose to actively encourage someone today? Now, it doesn't matter how many times you encourage in the past. You might even say, well, I have. I've even written encouragement notes to people, and no one's ever sent me an encouragement note. The question you have to ask yourself is, but have you encouraged someone today? Because that's what Hebrews 3.13 is saying. Encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today. Now, if there's one clear sign of someone who is hardened in sin, it's that they don't encourage others. In fact, they discourage others. I mean, this is a very obvious characteristic of a hardened heart. A hardened heart is one that is prone not only to discouraging others, but it is critical, complaining, disputing, divisive, provoking. It is a heart that manifests then unwholesome words, tearing down instead of edifying, is not considerate of the timeliness and appropriateness of words. Instead of dispensing grace, dispenses bitterness. It is really literally the very opposite of Ephesians 4.29. Now consider again the context and the background of the book of Hebrews. There's persecution against Christians, against the church. There's a temptation to return to the old legalistic traditions of Judaism. But the author of Hebrews says, there is a better way. What is that better way? It is found in Christ. Jesus is the ultimate high priest. He gave himself up to save those who are sinners, you and me. And he called us to live a life in light of all that he has accomplished on our behalf. And if you go back to Hebrews chapter 10 and, and you go a few verses before, it, it calls us to draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. That's uh, verse 22. Because why? Because we have had our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience through Jesus Christ who has cleansed us. It says we are called to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Because the God of all hope, he, he keeps all his promises. He will be faithful. And then we are called to stimulate one another loving good deeds. Why? Because we have been overwhelmingly loved by God in Christ. He sacrificed his own life to die on our behalf to save us from our sins, not only just to save us from our sins, but that enables us to then love with the kind of love with which we have been loved. So if you notice there in Hebrews 10, 22 to 25, there's this triad of faith, hope, and love. You see, the true believer walks in faith, hope, and love. Why? Because Christ is Lord and Savior. The true believer has submitted to his lordship in such a way it's abundantly clear that your faith is in Christ, that your hope is in Christ, that you know the love of Christ. And that's what compels you then to no longer live for yourself, but to live for him, to seek first his kingdom, to seek first his righteousness. And so one very tangible way to show that you are walking in faith, hope, and love is to then encourage one another in the Lord daily. This is something that we are all called to do, but it's not just that we are called to do it. It's something that all of us can do. You see, there's no one at Lighthouse LA that is incapable of being able to encourage someone. You know, so, sometimes I'll receive just a kind note or, or an email or a message. And uh, even this past week, you know, some of you sent some just kind emails uh, just in, in reference to things that are going on. And, you know, I can't tell you how encouraging it is, especially when I hear that people are growing. When you're taking to heart God's truth and, and then you're uh, convicted by it, you know, you might really be humbled. You, you might realize, wow, you know what, uh, I, I realize there's so much I need to learn. 
In fact, yesterday when we were at Dr. Somerville, uh, one of the most encouraging things was how transparent he was and, and how he shared about his struggles and even his failures and the lessons that he learned along the way. Uh, and that's one thing that I'm so grateful for in being able to uh, spend time uh, with people like that because uh, it shows me that God is using their lives, uh, even the struggles that they have, uh, that they've wrestled through, in sharing how they have trusted the Lord and, and they've even had to uh, humbly admit that they need to be corrected and so forth. That is such a huge encouragement. So that's what we should do. That, that, that's something that Lighthouse LA really needs to be committed to doing. That's what we should do. Now what we shouldn't do, and we'll go over this real quickly, is we should not forsake the assembling. You know, if you continue there in Hebrews 10, uh, 25, it says, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. What we should do is encourage and love. What we should not do is forsake the assembling. Now, what does it mean to not forsake? It means that we shouldn't desert. We shouldn't abandon. Now, what should we not desert or abandon? The assembling together. The word assembling here is the Greek word where we get the word synagogue from. And so the synagogue was literally the assembling of God's people. Now, uh, you know, we talk about the antonym for this word. Uh, it's this, uh, for the word assembling. It's the same idea of forsaking. You see, either you are assembling or you're forsaking. Those are the two choices. The idea of assembling together is not that you're just physically hanging out, that you're just loitering or hanging out with people casually. It's not that you kind of plan like a play date and you just spend time together. This assembling is actually something that defines you. You see, when you gather together as God's people, there's something about the corporate nature that defines who you are. That's why our identity in Christ is not simply an individual one. It's vitally, vitally connected to a corporate identity. Now, to give you an example of how important it was to belong to an assembly, uh, in John chapter 9, if you remember, when Jesus heals the blind man, and uh, the, the religious leaders are, are angry. You know, they're like, Who, this happened on the Sabbath. How could you allow this to happen? And so they confronted the blind man's parents. The blind man is now healed. And so his parents are confronted and they asked, you know, is this your son? And how did this happen? And in John 9, 22, it says that the parents, they were afraid of the Jews because if anyone conf confessed Jesus to be the Christ, they were going to be put out of the synagogue. You see, and to be put out of the synagogue meant that you were cast out. And you were literally a social outcast. You would be declared outside of the assembly of God's people. So to belong to the synagogue was very much a part of your identity in Jewish culture. And to be cast out of it would be a horrible position to be in. So that's why the parents were afraid to say anything. They said, that's why they said, he is an adult. You, you go ask him. Now, this idea of forsaking the assembling, for us, it's not just that you maybe missed a few Sundays. But it's an understanding that the very definition of your Christian identity is bound in corporate worship as the body of Christ. And the question is, are you forsaking that? Are you deserting that? Are you abandoning that? Now, I don't think it's always something that's maybe so malicious or, or so harsh in how it's being done. In fact, I think in many ways it's more of a subtle thing, especially here in America. It's related more to the comfort and convenience aspect of things. But really what it comes down to is, you know, when you uh, consider what it means to be part of the body of Christ, do you see that as vitally connected to your identity as a Christian? Now, your identity as a Christian is not simply that you are in connection with other Christians. It's because of your relationship with Christ that defines that. That's what unites you to other Christians. Uh, Spiros Zodiades in his Word Study Dictionary says this in reference to Hebrews 10.25. He says, uh, Hebrews 10.25 does not merely denote the assembling for corporate worship as a solitary occasional act, but as customary conduct 
uh, the preposition epi, which is part of the Greek word for assembling there, must refer to Christ himself. The word to there, epi, uh, must refer to Christ himself as the one to whom this assembly was attached. Thus, it would have the meaning of not betraying one's attachment to Jesus Christ and other believers, not avoiding one's own personal responsibility as part of the body of Christ. You see, it is because you are part of the body of Christ. He is the head of the church because you are attached to him. That is what then unites you to other believers. And so you have a personal responsibility to the body of Christ because you belong to the body of Christ in being connected to Christ. The reason why gathering together is God's people, the reason why it's so important, it's so significant, it is a non-negotiable issue to gather together to Christ because he is the head of the church. He is the head to the body to which we belong. So we gather to be with him. To forsake the assembling together is to reject the priority and con conviction of being committed to Christ as head of the church. It is to abandon your responsibility to be an active member in fulfilling your personal responsibility to the body of Christ. That's why this isn't just a matter of, well, you know, am I serving or am I participating in some way, uh, fulfilling a role? No, this is really organic in terms of how it defines you. And that's why that word forsake is a very strong word. It's, are you a deserter? Even the idea of betrayal is brought up. Would you desert your Lord and Savior when he calls you to be faithful to him? You know, if you recall the night before Jesus went to the cross and uh, Judas betrays Jesus. And, you know, if there was anyone who had the most incredible opportunity, it was Judas. He was with Christ in person. He bore witness to all that Christ taught, to all that Christ did, the miracles that he performed. Judas was an eyewitness to all those things, yet he deserted him. He betrayed him. How could someone do that when you're actually with Christ? Well, it's when you choose to reject him as Lord and Savior. Being actively involved in the life of the church is much more than a mere issue of physical attendance or casual activity. You need to see assembling together as an issue of honoring the head of the church, fulfilling your calling to be part of the body of Christ. It is a matter of loyalty. It is a matter of faithfulness. It is a matter of devotion. You know, it would be appropriate to use the analogy that we are fellow soldiers of the faith. We stand together because of the one who has enlisted us. Second Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says this, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Are you committed to pleasing the one who enlisted you as a soldier? Do you really recognize Christ to be the commander of your life? That's to whom we are, our allegiance belongs to. This forsaking, we are also called, don't make it a habit. Now, there's a sad reality here in Hebrews 10.25. It says, uh, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. Back then, and even today, there are those who have made it a habit, a custom. Uh, this is the bent of their life, that they are a forsaker, a deserter an abandoner. They've gone AWOL. So when you are not encouraging one another, when you're not stimulating one another to love and good deeds, when you're not considering how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, the, the other side of that is tragic. And so you don't want to head down to that direction. Don't make it a habit to go that way. In fact, if anything, Day by day, until the day of Christ's return, when it says, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The, this idea of encouragement is so vital to the body of Christ that we are called to do this day after day, 
until that day that Christ returns. So that's why it should be characteristic of the church day after day. Now, the past few months, we've been centering the Sunday sermons around the theme of biblical church leadership as we're preparing for the appointing of elders and deacons and deaconesses in the near future. If you remember when Carlos Chung was preaching, he said uh, this idea of the elder is not just about a title. Uh, that's not what defines it. It's the character and it's the work. But that character and work is not limited to those with the title. In fact, the character and the work is to be characterized by all Christians. You see, church leadership is not just about a title or position. Church leadership is about doing the work of ministry in such a way that shows that you love the Lord, that you love people according to God's word. So not all members of the church will have formal roles of leadership, but all members of the church are called to be obedient to the calling which Christ has called all of this church to fulfill. So if you can imagine Lighthouse LA being this kind of a church, a church that is characterized by a, a Christ-honoring, spirit-empowered, God-glorifying encouragement, this encouragement that is going to be patient and kind toward one another, and, and this encouragement that is unwavering, that even though circumstances are hard, are hard, you will not give up on encouraging someone so easily that you will dispense encouragement generously, that, that you will do it without partiality, that you would do it willingly, that this is not something you have to, to feel coerced to do, but that this flows out of a love for Christ. And even when it's hard to encourage, that you would persevere in encouraging, and that you would persevere encouraging day after day after day. Because there are always going to be people who need to be encouraged. As long as it's called today, we are called to do that. I mean, even this morning, I, 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 I would be, I think, very, um, it would be easy to assume this. Uh, there's someone who's discouraged. Uh, there's someone who's sad. There's someone maybe despairing because of trials, maybe because of hardships. Uh, maybe there's someone struggling with sin. Uh, they feel ashamed. Uh, they're embarrassed to admit that they're struggling. Uh, there are those who are facing the loss of a relationship, a friendship. And maybe there's trouble in the family. Uh, there's trouble in marriage with, with, with children. Uh, there, there are these weights, that, that, uh, burdens that, that are weighing heavy on them. Uh, maybe there's someone who's lonely, depressed, you know, maybe feels like giving up on relationships with people because you feel like nobody cares. There are so many opportunities to encourage. The only question is, are you considering? Are you giving deliberate and purposeful thought to how you can encourage? Stop waiting for someone to encourage you and start encouraging someone else. Now, you know, even in your struggle, you still have the capacity to encourage someone. And you will find that in your encouraging of others, you will be encouraged. I mean, that's something I've learned so many times. So in closing, I want to give you, I'm going to call this, I don't know, uh, hashtag 2020 LBCLA encourage. Okay, maybe we can make that a thing. Uh, hashtag 2020 LBCLA encourage. And I am challenging you. In fact, I am calling you all out to do this. And if you don't do this, you are in disobedience to Christ. Not to me, but to Christ. Starting today, September 13th, will you, each member of the Lighthouse LA family, church family, will you carefully consider and prayerfully consider someone that you can encourage with the love of Christ through a kind deed, and do that today. Do that today, September 13th, not September 14th. Don't say, I'll do it tomorrow. Encourage someone today. Not only that, I want to ask you to pray for someone that you can stimulate to encourage someone else. In other words, it's not just that you encourage someone, but you're going to encourage someone to encourage someone else. 
that they would do it for the sake of somebody else. Will you make a commitment that you will find a way, however small, maybe sometimes you might have the ability to bless in a big way, but whether small or big, will you make it a point to encourage someone in the Lord today? Consider how you are contributing to cultivating an encouraging atmosphere that finds it natural to encourage someone as if it's second nature because it really is reflective of the nature that we have in Christ. I want to ask you to bow your heads at this point as we prepare for communion. And I want you to think carefully, consider carefully. Will you be obedient to Christ in this way? Each and every one of you who claims to be a Christian, you are called to obey this. Consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking the assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day draw near. This should define Lighthouse LA. Lighthouse LA should be a place where the encouragement that is in Christ, because we belong to him, will then flow toward one another it won't happen passively. It won't just happen on its own. It takes careful consideration. Will you pray right now that you would commit yourself to be an encourager in Christ, that you would encourage in love one another, and so that anyone that would come to Lighthouse at LA would see, you know, Christ is here at this church. Why? Because it is only Christ that can explain why people would do such a thing. This is not easy to do. In fact, it is difficult to do. In fact, the enemy, Satan, will try to thwart this effort to encourage one another by discouraging you, by maybe sending someone to deliberately discourage you. And you cannot allow that to deter you from being an encourager. You know, when I think about how Christ, who, who had to humble himself and, and who had to walk this earth and yet would show his kindness and give an encouraging word to someone who was just desperately in need. Jesus really is the ultimate example of one who encouraged. I mean, he comforted. He strengthened, he also admonished, he exhorted. In this way, you can only think as he walked with his disciples, he was this literal embodiment of this idea of parakaleo, to, to walk alongside and, and to give words of life, to stimulate his disciples to love and good deeds. This is what Christ did. This is what we are called to do. Even in that night before Jesus went to the cross, he showed them his heart by serving them. It must have been such a, a humbling moment when Jesus, who is Jesus, he takes the towel, he washes the disciples' feet, and he encourages them. He says, I, whom you call Lord, if I would do such a thing, would you then consider serving one another in this way too? 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 and following says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And we didn't give him thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, as we take the Lord's table, when you just fix your eyes on Christ, and when you consider all that he means to us, the kindness, the gentleness, 
the thoughtfulness that Christ showed to people. As you read the gospel accounts, he really shows us that he had this heart of encouragement. And how many times did he need to encourage his disciples in various contexts? And even in this last night before he goes to the cross, if you remember just the the upper room discourse and and the words of comfort that he brings to them, the words of confidence, uh, the encouragement that is found in his last words before he goes to the cross, it might be good to go through that sometime. Just read like John 13 to 17 and you see all the words that Christ shares with his disciples the greatest encouragement that we can receive is to know that christ gave himself up for us if you're not a christian this morning uh, i want to really challenge you Um, this issue of encouragement is such a practical thing but it's grounded not in just some nice sentimental motives or you know activity it's grounded in the person of christ And only in Christ can there be a true, eternal, lasting encouragement. And that only can come if you know Christ, if you've confessed that you are a sinner, that you are worthy of condemnation in hell, but that you are willing to bow the knee and trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior alone, because he has paid the penalty for sin. He is the one who can and will save you from sin. Will you repent and submit your life to him? And for those of us who are Christians, we need to always be reminded how precious it is that we call Lord Jesus our Lord and Savior. That he died for us and rose again so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him. So when we take the bread and the cup, we're constantly reminded of that. So let's take it together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for the precious gift of our Savior who died for us and rose again, who paid the penalty for sins, and who has called us to eternal life. And we know that while we live this life here on earth it is filled with the challenges that come because we are still um, having to face the reality of sin in our lives and in the world around us we have to deal with the sins of other people and it can be so discouraging but you have called us to be encouragers you have called us especially in the body of Christ, to be united in being encouragers because our encouragement is found in Christ when we assemble together. And that's why we gather together, that we would find our strength in Christ, that we would be reminded of our identity in Christ, that we would be reminded of our calling and all that we are to be and do because of Christ. May we be such a church that would be characterized by the encouragement that is in Christ, that there is a true fellowship of the Holy Spirit in our midst, that there is affection and compassion, that we are able then to be of the same mind, to have one heart, one spirit, that we would not think of our own interests, but the interests of others, that we would not just be driven by selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind that we would consider one another and what's more important than ourselves. And really, God, that's really at the heart of one who wants to encourage, that we would not think so much of ourselves, but that we would think of how we could be a blessing to others. And may you give us wisdom so we would know how to consider how to do that. And may we do this all in light of the great reality that it is Christ who has saved us and it is christ who comforts us who admonishes us who exhorts us and in that way shows that he is the true encourager of our lives 
And I pray that you would unite us together as a church to be such a place where encouragement would really be undeniably seen that we would bless each other through this encouragement in Christ to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.